Welcome back. Next up for the Airbus Maintenance Seminar is Corey Schiffen. He is a technical representative at Airbus Helicopters in Grand Prairie, Texas. Since 1994, he has worked on helicopters in the air tour industry in Hawaii and Las Vegas and provides support for military helicopters in Iraq in 2004 and 2005. Corey, thank you for joining us, joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone from wherever you are in the world. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my presentation is going to feature the AS350. It's, uh, it's widely used uh, law enforcement, uh, tourism, air ambulance. Um, so we're gonna get into this. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about information and using the correct information. So one of the first things we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about it uh, quite a bit is STCs versus TC. That means a supplemental type certificate versus um, the type certificate or factory, right? So we're gonna get an example here, okay? What we're looking at here is a main gearbox suspension bar and an air conditioning uh, compressor. The drive belt was too long and uh, someone wasn't paying attention, went to tension the belt and you can see we had mechanical contact between the two. Why? Because while the drive belt fit on the grooves of the compressor, it, it looked like the right part when they looked in the parts book. Unfortunately, um, for this person, the Airbus Eurocopter back then, ha we haven't made uh, air conditioning for the 350 in probably 30 years. So they went to a, our parts book for the factory aircraft, put the wrong belt on it. It was too long. And as you can see, we had the mechanical contact. Um, it's not just air conditioning, okay? We have, there's STCs and t seed options. Here's a tail rotor guard. You can have uh, one or the other, right? But there's differences. The STC has uh, standard American hardware, whereas the factory installed uh, version uses metric hardware. So um, we'd see STC or service bulletin, right? If it's factory, you could have it delivered on a helicopter, right? When you, when you order your helicopter, or once you have it, if you, you bought it from someone else or you bought it from the factory and later on down the road, you decided, hey, I'd like to have that tail rotor guard. Well, for the factory option, you could go to a service bulletin to install it, or you could go to an STC holder and get it, right? But it's important to know, which is it? We're talking about um, follow on maintenance instructions, right? And we're gonna talk about that too. If we have an STC, we're gonna, a lot of acronyms, I'm sorry for folks around the world if you don't use these same acronyms, but if we have an STC, we're gonna use something called an ICA or an Instructions for Continued Airworthiness, right? That's where we would go. If it's a factory option, we're gonna to go to our uh, MSM or our Master Servicing uh, Manual, okay? So two different places and where we get our information, again, it's pretty important, right? The torques could be different, when we look at things, how we look at things, all of that. So here's an example, there's an STC. Um, you can go to the FAA website, of course, and get the STC information. If you have the STC number, you can find out who owns it and uh, what it's for, all right? So in the same example, we talked about the STC. Well, here's the factory option, right? Post delivery via a service bulletin. Okay. Yes, it has happened. Yes, I've had people that have mixed the parts up between the two for different options. Okay. Uh, like I said, the STC, it uses uh, standard hardware. Okay. Here's the service bulletin. It uses metric hardware. So a big difference. Also, what if the bolt fits in there? Well, just because it fits isn't, doesn't mean you're supposed to use it, right? So... Um, same thing. Here we have a um, cable cutter or wire strike installation. There's at least a few STC uh, wire strike or cable cutter installations that I can think of. And there's also the factory installation. So how would we know? Well, if you look at your records for the aircraft, you should be able to find what service bulletins have been installed on that aircraft. 
And if you have an STC, something like this, you have a FAA form 337 for a major modification or alteration, right? So we need to go to those. Um, so in this case, cable cutter, again, Eurocopter Canada, that's the STC. Factory option, um, service bulletins, right? Version, number, all right? Um, who owns the STC, right? You can go to the FAA again. Like I said, all that information is gonna be there and that's gonna be important, right? Like, who am I gonna go? People call me up, I'm a tech rep, right? So they call me up and they ask me about, hey, um, my air conditioning is not working. Can you help me? Yes, I can help you, but it would probably be better if I knew what STC you had so that I could get you in touch maybe with their technical support, right? Because it's not ours. Um, cable cutter, okay. STC, ICA or not, okay? So supplemental type certificate, instructions for continued airworthiness. It was not always a requirement, the instructions for continued airworthiness. So if it's really old, it wasn't required, so it may not be there. I have customers that call me and say, I need instructions uh, for continued airworthiness on whatever the, the option is, whatever the installation is, and I may look and see that there isn't any. Okay, and they come back and say, well, you have to give it to me. Well, if it's not there, I don't have it, but I will tell you that this cover sheet for the STC, it will tell you if there's instructions for continued error in this required or not. Here's an example of an old STC installation of tail rotor guard, and it doesn't have a requirement for a flight manual supplement or a maintenance manual supplement, okay? If you look over here, this is more modern. We have a, uh, a FLIR, forward-looking infrared, that, that was issued from the FAA much later, and it certainly does. It has instructions for continued airworthiness in a maintenance manual supplement, and it, uh, you can see if it has, it would also be on there for flight manual supplement, right, for the pilot as well, so that he knows um, what may have changed with his operation of the aircraft. Okay, so like I said earlier, supplemental type certificate, instruction for continuing airways, or MSM, two different issues. I've had people say, um, I'm in your MSM and I'm, I'm looking at this and I go, really? And then come to find out that what they're using our time period and our, is not our parts. So again, not right. That, that is very, very important information, okay? STC or TC, we need to know. All right, so I'm gonna give you an example here. All right, here's a illustration of an AS350, right? It's a, the side. Here in red, we can see where we adjust for our weight and balance, our CG longitudinally on the aircraft, okay? It's back here and you, you see it's very far back, so the arm is very far back. So if I make a little weight adjustment back here, it has a tremendous amount of effect on the aircraft, okay? So again, this is, the, this is where we adjust for um, longitudinal CG. This red box here represents a standard installation for a battery. And you can see that it's not very far off of the center line of the mass, right? So the effect of that weight on the CG is not as great as if it was back on the tail boom or back where the weights are for adjusting, right? Well, STC now, um, at least a couple that I can think of, move that battery from that location close to the, around the mast back into the tail. So why would we do that? We do that because this weight that was here was just weight. We weren't using it for anything, really. We just found a good location where it's not gonna affect the CG of the aircraft. Well, instead of using it for more useful weight, we're gonna take that, put it in the tail boom, and now we're help, helping to balance the aircraft so it's not just more, we're using it for something now, okay? But we need to think about it. We just took all the weight, and the battery's fairly heavy, we put it back in the tail boom. All right, so what, is, what effect is that gonna have on our balancing weights now? Well, if we're paying attention to the ST and C instructions, it has a lot of effect on it. If we install our STC 
and then we go to our maintenance manual, well, tools are not the same. So standard location for that battery, remember, close to the center line of the mass of the transmission area, right? Uh, total allowed a little over 44 pounds in the standard location, right? 44 pounds back here if that battery sits here. Well, if we move our battery back into the tail boom, that goes down depending on uh, which installation we have. At our lowest point or our most, uh, well, how would I say this, restrictive, if you will, for uh, the Canadian battery on a B3 with dual hydraulics, the max ballast we're allowed to have is 8.8 .8 pounds. Well, if I'm not paying attention and I have a lot of equipment up here, remember, the at load towards the front of the aircraft, it's going to be forward CG, right? So I'm going to want to ballast it in the tail. Well, that's great. But remember, in this instance, we're talking about it's 8.8 .8 pounds back here. But if I don't follow the instructions for continued airworthiness, I don't follow that STC instructions. No, I go to the maintenance manual and I see that I, I think I can put 44.17 pounds back there. But with this heavy battery, if I put all that weight down there, this tail boom, right? Now, at the interface between the aft fuselage and the tail boom, that force has to go somewhere. I can't just keep increasing that weight. Now the engineers, right, they came up and said, well, you can have that battery there, but these are your limitations. Now you can see this is a um, example of how critical that is to follow whatever it is, be it a, um, an STC or the factory TC option. Okay, this is just a cutaway showing you uh, tail boom, vertical fins, tail cone. We have weights that go on the spar here for the fin, and then we have uh, additional weights that go back into the tail cone here. And this is just a close up showing you um, what we just saw. All right, um, this is the uh, main rotor head, um, swash plate. Uh, we can see here uh, a lot of things. The, the blue section here, we don't usually, typically we won't have balance weights on that because we have the rotating scissor assembly here. So that's a heavier part of the rotating mass. All right, so we're gonna talk about the Starflex here. And here we have the mast. We have 12 bolts that hold that Starflex main rotor hub, if you will, onto the mast. And we're gonna talk about that and, uh, and some, some errors that some folks have made and how to avoid that, okay? Here is a, a coupling or an attachment bolt. There's 12 of them. Six of them look like this and have um, studs at the end of it. There's six that don't have that, okay? There's 12 bolts again that, that mount onto through the mast. And you can see that this nut is both curved and it's, it's radiused, okay? And it fits up underneath the mast. So you can see the bushings there. All right, so this is from a, a newsletter article that I wrote in, in 2015 when I start, first started seeing this happen, okay? What you can see here, I'm gonna go back just real quick. There's the 12 bolt holes that go all the way through the Starflex. There's a close-up picture of it, okay? If you look closely, you can see those grooves right there. What those grooves are caused by is the thread of, of one of those bolts. This side doesn't have any threads, the other side does. Okay, so we're gonna talk about why did that happen? In the beginning, there was only one. Somebody called and they said, hey, I made this, and I thought, wow, that's interesting, I have not seen that. Unfortunately, I had somebody came back and said, I have six of those, okay? My opinion should have never got that far. We're gonna see why I should have not got that far. First off, if you're taking nuts and bolts apart with a few exceptions, they should come out in your hand. It shouldn't be difficult. You shouldn't say, that's okay. I'm pretty strong, I can make this happen, okay? And we're gonna see um, that here. Here's an example. There's a, another close-up of that Starflex bushing. Here's one of those coupling bolts. This, these are one of the six that doesn't have the studs on the end. And this right here is metal transfer from that bore onto that bolt. 
Now we can see, and you know, they say everybody makes mistakes. If I take one bolt out that looks like that, I'm not doing five more. Okay, that's it. Um, so we're gonna look, and here's the mast, okay? So remember, the bolt goes down, it goes through that star flex, then it goes down and it goes through the mast. And when we had the same, same type of damage on the mast, which isn't surprising. So let's, let's talk about why did that happen, all right? So that star flex up there, it has a service life limit. We fly a certain amount, like a lot of parts on the helicopter, right? We fly a certain amount of number of flight hours, and then we have to take that aircraft, that part off the aircraft, it's done. We have to replace it, okay? So we put that star flex on there, we put the bolts on, and we torque everything up. Everything's great, pilot takes it out, he flies. Our MSM, or Master Servicing Manual, will tell us in X amount of hours, between this and this usually, you're gonna go back and you're gonna do a torque check and make sure everything's fine. Okay, so we go back and, you know, and I turned it and, and the nut moved. Well, that's kind of okay, all right? Because that's why we're here. We're here trying to make sure that it's fine. So then fast forward to 600 flight hours later or thereabouts, it's a 600 flight hour requirement or 24 months, right? I need to take those bolts out and inspect them for corrosion, all right? So I go out and I take that first one out and I cut threads in it. Hopefully not, but let's say that I did. Why is it? that I put those bolts in and everything was fine and now I take it out. It's because the whole thing has shifted either lead or lag. The whole, it has rotated. That whole star flex has shifted one direction or the other and it's up against the side of the bolt and that's not a big deal until I take one out and the other 11 are holding it in place and will not let it move. So what's a better way to do this? slack all of your hardware and center the star flex take get a turn or two back and it, we won't damage anything then take them all out but the thing to remember is right the don't use your muscles right just relax everything and take the bolts out one at a time and if one of them's difficult to come out stop and call me or someone okay we've seen the damage and the the bushing here i will tell you Typically, if it's just one and it's not bad, you can contact me. Well, we're all over the world, right? So whoever your local technical representative is, for most of my customers, I've ha had them, they've been able to, I've been able to send them something, telling them to, to attenuate the high spots, knock that damage down so that it doesn't contact the bolts and get down the road. As long as the bushing has not spun and the same thing for the mast. Now, these can be replaced in the mast, unfortunately, not in the field. So if you spin one of those, all you have to do is completely remove the transmission, take the mast out and send it in for an overhaul, approved overhaul facility or repair shop. Okay, we're gonna talk about uh, engine mounts. Okay, we have on the uh, AS350, we have aft uh, rubber elastomeric mounts. Right, they're covered with a, a metal to protect them from heat. The front side of the engine is supported by what we call a gimbal. It's kind of like a, a universal joint, if you will. Okay, so here are here is a picture a customer sent me, and because uh, I requested it, what happened was they would turn the main rotor head, and they heard um, a clicking sound, and they wanted to know what it was. Well, what the clicking sound was, was a flexible coupling. And it was doing its job and flexing as it was turned. And there's a couple of reasons you can have that. And I said, can you please send me some pictures? So, so they sent me the pictures of this engine mount. And I said, gee, you know, that looks a little odd to me. It looks to me like you have a smaller gap on one side than you have on the other. And I'm sorry, I know it's a lot of work, but can you please remove that engine and take a look at that engine mount? Well, when they did, sure enough, here is a, a new or serviceable mount, and here's the one that came off. As you can see, it's twisted, okay? So what my theory of how this works is, whenever you work with the engine or the gimbal, you have to support the front side, okay? You're gonna support it, the front of the engine, and you can 
if you're going to change it, you'll loosen this, take the engine out. That gimbal, if you remove that and don't have the support, all this weight in front on that arm flexes downward, right? So I'm not saying at all that this is the cause, but if you were to put a block of wood or something underneath there, and that wood were to kick out and all that weight were flexed, it would do exactly what we saw, okay? Again, you can see that it's, it's pretty twisted there. I apologize. Okay, now we're looking at it and it's the same all the way around, okay? Uh, we can see that we are supposed to, anytime we pull that engine out, we're supposed to look at those mounts and check them for condition, um, in good condition, right? And if you, any of the customers here in the United States we need to know what the good condition is, you can come to me and I'll give you more of a definition. But typically, if you try to take the cover off and it won't because it's so swollen or you take it apart and the thing's almost ripped in half, it's pretty self-explanatory. This is what they look like when they are not covered by the metal cover, right? They just thread down inside and then you drop the cover over it, run the nut down. More views of the same thing. And here's the front side. That's what I was talking about. Here's the gimbal. You have pins on the side, pins on the top and the bottom so that it can move around. The rotor brake is here, but this is the support for the front of the engine. Okay, um, we have a video here. Okay, now that was just to illustrate um, one that condition is not good. Okay, the aircraft was flying, a customer contacted me, sent me the video, and, and asked me what I thought, and uh, it's fixed now. Okay. Um, we're gonna talk about tooling and procedures. I know this is close up, it's hard to tell what this is. Uh, this is a main gearbox. This is an input. There's a seal that goes here, an input seal. And here is the correct tool that you use to remove that seal. You would back this um, bolt out. You put the fingers in, in actually, three of them in around three spots opposing each other, say 120 degrees apart, as close as you can get in the seal. Then you put it on the tool, put the clamp on it, tighten it, and then you install it. Well, by looking at this gearbox, it would appear at some point in its life, someone did, either did not have or did not use the proper tool. And it appears to me, if I had to speculate, that someone used a drill, drilled in seal and use a self-tapping metal screw and a slide hammer, which is a trick some people have used in the past, but unfortunately they didn't just get the seal and they got the gearbox. I was able to, through um, the dynamic component expert group, to get a repair for this customer because that wasn't a high pressure area. And that was very lucky because that would have been tremendously expensive and a lot of man hours if they had to do it. So. Right. There's a saying that there's never enough time to do the job right, but you always end up doing it twice, right? There's time to do it twice. So this is an example of that. Okay. The rotor brake and its adjustment. You can see bluing around the outside of this um, rotor brake. Okay. That's a sign, obviously, of, of, of heat. Um, a lot of things can happen with this, and we're going to see some examples of that, right? We can put, we can apply our rotor brake too soon there's nothing really that keeps that from happening, happening other than uh, the person who's operating the aircraft looking at the rotor tack to see what the RPM is. Our flight manual tells you what those limitations are. They tell you how many minutes between you can have. They tell you um, if, if the wind's gusting, they even take that into account, okay? But we can't take into account that if the RPM's too high and you just grab a hold of the rotor brake and pull on it. Here's some examples of rotor brakes that are not in good shape. Here's one that either my speculation again was that either it wasn't adjusted properly, had no gap and the aircraft was started, um, or the rotor brake was applied at too high of a speed. Okay, again, we have um, the discoloration, 
um, extreme heat. Under extreme heat, I found it in my experience that the brake can actually cone. And you'll go back and you'll say, wow, and you put a new brake pad in there and there's no clearance. And wow, what's going on? Or, or yeah, you put a new brake pad on there, you have no clearance, take this off, put it on a table, put a straight edge on it, and sure enough, you found that the edges have curled over. If that happens, you can order a new brake flange, that's what it's called, a flange, but there is a master shim that's ground at overhaul that stays with the gearbox. You don't have to remember that, you can call. Okay, some people have made some, some pretty big mistakes by not paying attention or, or and or to what they're doing or not knowing what the symbols are. All these symbols here, they have meaning, right? This one means that it's a dry torque. It has a grease gun with an X on it, and that's our torque symbol, so it's a dry torque. This one here has a lot of things, right? It has this symbol, which if we look for it, it's going to tell us that we have to add the drag torque. This is going to tell us that it's a, a wet torque or a grease torque is even gonna tell us what kind of oil or grease we're supposed to use, and that's the torque symbol. So what all this means is I'm supposed to add grease to the threads, and we're going to see here in just a second how much of a difference that makes when we apply it. You could essentially double the torque by adding that grease. And looking at it the opposite way, you don't put that grease that's on there. Now you've under-torqued it by twice. The drag torque, there's another one. Our books will tell you that you are supposed to fully engage the threads when you check the, the drag. Well, if you put one or two on there instead of five, and you say, okay, it's 40 inch pounds instead of 300, that's gonna make a difference. So if we were to not add the drag torque, not put grease on it and go, okay, here's my torque. Well, it's happened, right? Here's the symbol. And this is out of the standard practice manual, and it's going to tell us how to do this. Uh, locking torque measurements, locking torque, drag torque, okay? Same thing. We're going to add that, and we're going to have our final torque, okay? Engage the nut entirely on the screw. That's what I was talking about, and it makes such a difference. All right. Okay. Paying attention, we're going to see this in a little while of torquing procedures on the, on the uh, bi-directional cross beam, affectionately known as the dog bone, because it kind of looks like that. There are some laminates on there, right? So when we go and assemble it, somebody might torque it, click, good, I'm done, right? Walk away, put it on the helicopter, pilot goes out, flies, comes back, and we're gonna see what that looks like, and something has spun. Well, that bi-directional cross beam has zero defect allowed because we had one crack a long time ago and there's an error word in this directive against it. So we allow no defects. If we don't take that out of there, then we may be buying a new one, okay? Because if the metal spins on that bi-directional cross beam laminate, we damage it. But what the book says is that we're gonna wait 20 minutes. So I torque it and I'm, if I'm using a click type torque wrench in this example, you don't have to, but it clicks set it on the table, I come back 20 minutes and it's gonna move and it's gonna keep moving until I get to a certain point where it doesn't move. And we're gonna see that, but why is that? Because it again is a laminate. So we have rubber, metal, rubber, and metal. I click it and then it relaxes and it's gonna keep doing that until it can't relax anymore and that's what we want. And trust me, from experience I can tell you, it, is no fun when you've returned an aircraft to service and two days later, you're telling somebody, I'm sorry, bring the aircraft back into a hangar. I need to pull the gearbox off. I need to do that whole thing again. I did it already once, but now we're gonna do it again. Okay. So when we talked about the difference that the grease might make on the threads, this is standard practice and it's gonna talk about the correction factor, right? Adding grease to it how much difference does it make? There's 0.5 right there, that's half, right? That's quite a bit. Now, what does it look like when something hasn't been assembled properly? Well, we have galling here. If we look close at um, our, our, our pinion, right, where everything slides on there, we can have extreme knife edging, corrosion, and there's that master, um, 
shim that I was talking about, although now it's damaged because the stack up got loose and everything was uh, working there. There is our rotor brake flange that I was talking about and showing the discoloration. And you can see that this was so loose and rocking back and forth that now we have damage from that pinion where this whole thing was working back and forth. On the aircraft, um, you would typically hear and feel a rumble through the aircraft if you have this situation. Bidirectional cross beam, like I said, we affectionately known as a dog bone. That's because of what it looks like. What does it do? Where is it? It's between the transmission cutout um, on the airframe. One half of it is bolted there through those laminates. The other side goes to our transmission. It deals with uh, a lot of the loads um, from the main rotor system going down to the airframe and isolates them and absorbs that load. So here we have what you would see on a laminate that's spun on the dog bone. Right now we're, we're looking from the transmission deck, looking down, here's our main gearbox, here's our bi-directional cross beam, and those are our laminates. You can see here that we have some flats on this washer that should be parallel or even with the flat of this bi-directional cross beam and the transmission deck. However, we don't because it's been rotated. Now, the only way that this is gonna rotate is if it's loose. And the only reason it's gonna be loose is because it's under torqued. Okay, we didn't follow procedure. This illustrates the tool. This is what I mean by being parallel or even with the bi-directional cross beam. Here's a tool that I'm going to uh, put in a vise. It's gonna hold it. Maybe I'm gonna have a friend hold the other end of the uh, cross beam so that when I turn it, I don't have my tool dig into it. That's just a little bit of friendly information there, okay? This is a hollow bolt, right? I'm torquing this castellated nut. After I install this in the aircraft, if something moves, you can forget about going back on to this castellated nut because it's, it's, it, it won't work. Um, that's it. So you would want to take your time doing this, okay? This is as far as that tool can rotate before it starts doing mechanical damage to the cross beam. I have that there and I tell people, they say, well, I've had people argue with me and say, well, it didn't move. I say, okay, well, can you put the tool on it? And they say, no. And I say, well, then it did move. Um, okay, so here's the, the face, the critical area of that bi-directional cross beam or dog bone zone B, and we do not allow any defects in that area, okay? So this is not correct. I mean, you can see clearly that the flats are vertical. They're, they're not almost roughly 90 degrees from where they needed to be. This is correct. This is not correct. And just one other side note, as I look at this, right? Somebody has put um, a slip mark here and that's great. But sometimes you'll have somebody puts a slip mark here and they put a slip mark here and they put a slip mark here. No, how about we put one line across to everything? Because I'll tell you, the relationship of this bolt and nut can stay the same the whole time and be spinning around and you just go, okay, well, let's find the lines there. Well, what if, if it wasn't supposed to be there? What if it was supposed to be over here so we can make one line all the way across? Here's a close up of after removal of a laminate, like for instance, this one, it's sitting up against a face and there's the face and what it looks like after that spun laminate can be removed. We'll see that we have scarring there. And so that's um, rejected, that has to be replaced. Here's a cutaway view of one of those laminates, like we discussed metal, rubber, metal rubber, and so on. And the hollow bolt that, that holds it onto the bi-directional cross beam. This is the sandwich that you squeeze and you wait and you come back and you keep going until it doesn't do it. Um, that's it. Um, some pictures that I've received asking me if this is good. It's not good. 
right? It, it hasn't been good for a long time. Um, this right here, typically you see this kind of damage when it's wet because some kind of a, a, a petroleum product got on there. It could be main gearbox oil, uh, engine oil, it could be hydraulic fluid, anything like that. If you get it on there, leaks happen, wash it off and, and your laminates will last longer. Extreme case of a laminate that was not okay, right? Okay, gonna jump back to um, options, okay? What we have right here, we're gonna talk about wire strike and a pitot support. Here's a wire strike going up the center, the center wire strike going up the center windshield in between this, this center post between the left and the right side of the windshield, right? So here we have the pitot support. This is the heater, right? We, we have that on when we fly. This right here is a drain hole and it's plugged with sealant. Now, the person that installed this or replaced this did not know that because you have a wire strike, you're supposed to embrittle this support. And what that means is we're supposed to drill holes around the base of it so that if we hit a wire, we don't rip the nose of the helicopter off or do more damage, right? So there should have been four more holes, large in diameter around the side, and that center hole is the only hole that really um, needed to be open because we have heat here. So what we're gonna have, right, is condensation. It's gonna sweat. We need a place for that to um, drain. Cable cutter installation, here's our service bulletin. There's two of them, depending on your version, okay? So, but for in regards to this embrittling of the PETA support, it really doesn't matter because they both have the exact same template that you could print out pick up the existing holes on your new pitot support that you're putting on there. It has you drill the holes and then ream them out a little bit larger so that um, they don't crack. You wanna clean the hole up with a reamer and then you install it. So that's it. And this is what it looks should look like after you're done. Additional holes are drilled. You can put sealant in there, that's fine. But the center one is, is open for that condensation uh, to come out. Right, it's gonna drain out that from the heat. Okay, so horizontal stabilizer and the mounts, right? So here's our tail boom. Uh, been different, different versions of that through the years and how they mount. Some things, however, don't change, like ensuring that we have it shimmed properly, right? Um, what this is, okay, out on the bottom side here, there are some, uh, you almost, you could call it a, a, a white area washer. It's got four sides, but it has a top and a bottom. So there's eight options that you're gonna have of installing it. This is what I'm talking about. I could flip it every way. And here we have the radius of the tail boom. And somebody on this particular installation really wanted to put the edge of the, that white area washer, if you will, up against the tail boom. They put it in so, so close that when they torqued the nut, it was in the radius and cracked it. There's no need for that. All we're trying to do is spread that load out a little bit, but instead in spreading it out over the area, we put it right into the radius of the tail boom, right? Well, not the tail boom, but what we call a fish plate, right? On the tail boom. Unfortunately, that's no longer a field level repair. So we will probably have to send a team out unless you have somebody in your area that can do it. And this is what I'm talking about. There's two doublers, um, and sometimes you can get lucky if this happens and, and only require replacing that outermost doubler. Here's one with a lack of shims, right? So you put the stabilizer in there, you know it's got a lot of slop, and just tighten the bolt. Well, don't be surprised when it breaks because you don't have any resistance on your stack up. Just a close-up view of the same thing, there's that that tab washer, if you will, the sh that washer. Okay, horizontal stabilizer and your position lights, okay? This is nothing new. On a daily inspection, I used to go and tap the bottom of the stabilizer. You know, grab the back of the tail boom, make sure all the big pieces aren't falling off, right? That's important. If you tap the bottom of the stabilizer and you hear something bouncing in there, then you can investigate, right? Well, 
Here we can see on this blue, or I can see anyway, hopefully you can too. This blue wire here has been chafing and the installation, insulation rather is gone. Well, on, the, on the, the surface that is rubbing on, which would be the inside of the horizontal stabilizer, the bottom of it, it's been wearing away the paint. I, I know that, right? You have two surfaces wearing on each other. Now, eventually what'll happen is you start getting arcing on the positive wire, right? If you don't do something about it, eventually you will actually get a hole in your stabilizer. But there's no way that you cannot know that because you should be either popping a breaker or blowing a fuse, depending on how old your aircraft is and how it's configured, right? In the old days, we would just go in there, put heat shrink in there. We would put heat shrink in there and problem solved. Well, we actually came out with a service bulletin, okay, that told you, yes, go in there, put heat shrink on there and protect it. If the wire's too long, secure it, okay? Nothing should be bouncing in, in, on the stabilizer. If you do that, you'll save yourself some time, um, obviously repairing it. More damage here, right? We, have, we can have holes from arcing. We can also have damage from the electrical conduit inside. There's little clamps that come loose. But again, I promise that if you were to bounce your hand, just lightly tap on the horizontal step, you would have had that, heard that bounce inside. At that time, you could call me if you're in my area of the world, and I would tell you, take those rivets off, and I would give you all the hardware. You're going to take the, the side off, the end cap that's making that noise, look back in there, and I would tell you, okay, I need you to tell me if the spar's damaged, and if the spar's damaged, I would get you a repair through our engineering, and then give you some hints and some ways to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But once it goes to this, um, this is not the easiest repair because it does, it's not an even surface, all right? So here we go. Here's some of that arcing damage that I'm talking about. It's rubbed and arced through. Here's a clamp, right? Sometimes these will corrode, that'll break loose and the conduit will bounce around in there. But again, you can find it just by tapping it. There's a close up. This is the kind of picture, right? After I tell the person, they say, well, I got a problem. And I said, well, can you take the end cap off? So they take the end cap off and they send me that picture. Well, then I have to ask them how big is the damage? Because remember at first, well, this is a, a large example, but even here, I do not know how long, how big that damage is on, on the inside because it could be working out and it could be twice the, that size on the inside. So if you were looking at the bottom of this, it's gonna be small and you can see that the actual damage is probably more than twice the size it would be from the outside. So I have a measurement, but look at that. This is not the first time this has happened, right? This is not the second time, but at least the third time. Okay, this is uh, looking through the hole for the position light and we can see the clamp that's broken off and the rivet. You can see that it was working for a while before it did that. This is an example of what I might send a customer that says that they're having that problem. They hear something in there or um, they know that there's something wrong. Um, it has all your rivet part numbers, all your references for standard practice. It tells you you can go back in there with that rivet if you want, although that's difficult, right? Or I'll give you the option, you can go back in there with some standard hardware. And that might be hard, but you'll never have to do it again. Okay. Um, same thing with uh, the vertical fin. You grab a hold of the handle that you use for ground hold, handling the aircraft. You're moving around on the ground on wheels, right? You shake it a little from side to side. If you hear something inside the fin and it's bouncing, you have problems. You can wait. Um, sorry if I'm being obvious here. You can wait and you're gonna have more damage, but we're gonna see that sometimes people wait, okay? that didn't happen in a day or even a week. You can see there's more going on. There was repairs to both sides of this. So I don't know if there was a hole that was worked in it, but that spar for the upper vertical fin is damaged. Again, you have a clip that goes there with a rivet and the rivet broke and sat there and worked, okay? Um, here we have, this is tail rotor spider, okay? And uh, somebody was, there's a little rubber cap right here on this grease feeding. It's a regreasable bearing. Well, I guess that little piece of rubber was falling off and somebody said, you know what? 
I'm going to put a washer underneath that grease fitting, and that's going to hold my rubber piece on. Well, the problem with that is that this grease fitting is a pipe thread, okay? And with that washer on there, there's not enough thread engagement to hold it tight. So um, we're gonna see what happened there. Here's an example. This is correct, this is incorrect. That has a washer. Look at the safety wire. These are all correct. This was correct, but someone decided not to do it that way. It's not that they're not all positive, it's just that there's a better way in accordance with the book. Here's what happened with that grease fitting. And this is really amazing to me because the way that it struck this tail rotor blade, you can perfectly see both the end where the wrench goes and where the washer goes on that grease fitting. Again, there's the grease fitting in the washer and there's the imprint that it made on the tail rotor blade when it fell off, okay? Uh, I contacted the person that uh, was putting that washer on there. That doesn't happen anymore. Okay. Um, seat on the, for the back seat is something I've noticed when I've, I've, I've been out in my um, journeys. Should have a cotter pin in that, okay? That's obviously that's what's holding somebody in their seat if you have a problem, right? So um, the chance of this coming undone very low, but again, we don't work, we work on worst case scenarios, right? So we're gonna do the, make it as safe as we possibly can. Um, cotter pins, safety pins in those seats. Um, unfortunately, I've gone uh, to customer sites and other hangars and looked and said, just walking by the aircraft, your, your windows are in backwards, okay? AS350, the windows should only go in, not out. If the window's sitting on the outside of the airframe, I don't care where it is, there's a problem, okay? Only sits on the inside. Seems basic enough, right? Until you're there, I've had people call me in a panic. Okay, I've been here for two hours, I can't get this back in. I've done it every way I can. Well, there's four ways that you can put the seal on and there's one that's correct. If you need it, I have tip sheets on all this stuff that we've made. This is uh, me and my partner made this showing the incorrect ways to go in. Um, what can happen? Lots of things can happen. The window can come out, it can go through a rotor blade. That is, unfortunately, that's happened. Um, just real quick, uh, breakers, tail rotor pedals, right? Look, just one of my little clips is missing. That's not that big a deal, right? Well, it is if that thing flaps and the pilot's pedal gets wedged in there. Now he's got stuck pedal, right? Um, Flight controls, just real quick, right? Here's main rotor um, pitch change links on the main rotor um, for the main rotor head, right? And the swash plate. Had customers call and say, I, I'm having a hard time rigging this. Well, come to find out, they're either using the single hydraulics on a dual or vice versa. The pitch change links are different lengths. Here we can see the single versus the dual. Okay, um, here we go dual hydraulic uh, swash plate. You can see that there's no boot. Everything's raised because our servos are longer. So we had to raise everything up so we don't have room for a boot. We have a closeout plate that fits right there. All right, uh, customer uh, sent me this picture. He asked me a question. I was explaining it to him. He said, mine doesn't look like that. And what we're talking about are these friction washers right here. I said, yes, you're gonna have one on each side. He said, no, I don't have that. I have two on one and nothing on the other. I said, no, you don't. He sent me the picture. I said, yes, you do. Please don't fly that helicopter. And he didn't. And it was fixed, but metal to metal on one side and double friction on the other side. Okay, here we have the, um, the drive collar on a dual hydraulic aircraft. Our manual will tell you to check your perpendicularity. That means that this thing needs to be straight so you have an even gap all the way around. Clearly this didn't happen. It's cocked and so it was making uh, contact as it went. You know, close up of that. Here's a single hydraulic aircraft, more room so we have a boot. Okay, uh, real quick, it's gonna be my uh, closing here. Um, what we have here is um, the Aerial One engine. Rod, rod end cable, rod fuel 
control. Fuel control throttle with a safety pin in it. However, with a slight push, that should not be able to happen. You can see the wear on the rod end, and our spring doesn't completely retract at some time. So with the diaper pin in, this could be installed and removed. There's no safety on it. Okay, so pretty big deal because that's what happened. That's the back of the engine. There's your free turbine. Everything went out. It went full unregulated or emergency power, just like if you were sitting in an Aerial One, uh, um, a B model or a BA or a B2 and just threw the, the emergency throttle, all the, the throttle to the emergency position. Fortunately, it was on start and uh, everything worked out basically. And uh, that's going to, that's going to um, wrap up my presentation. Um, see if we're having any uh, questions now at this time. Well, thanks, Corey. Uh, covered a lot of information about Airbus models. Uh, some may not occur to anybody, didn't occur to me, is if it's an STC or a TC design change, service bulletin, one could use standard, the other one may use metric. So, so that's a good point for everybody to keep in mind. Yes, sir. Um, but we have a, a couple of questions that came in. Uh, first one, almost related to STCs, is uh, does Airbus have does Airbus have STCs or do they just do the service bulletin IE type design changes? We do have STCs. Now, on us be careful when I say um, Airbus because some of the examples that I gave were AHI. That means here Airbus uh, USA. We have them. Um, Airbus Canada. They have their STCs too. And thank you for bringing that up. It's a great point. Somebody may say, well, I have an Airbus STC and they come to me and sometimes I have to go to Canada to get them what they need. But I mean, that's definitely the way, at least you know what you have. But yes, um, our STCs typically come uh, not from the main company, but from the US and Canada that we deal with. Thanks. Uh, next question it has to do with the, I believe it was the Starflex, when you're talking about Starflex. Do you, yes, need do you need thread in the Starflex or the Flex where, th where threads are not engaged? Uh, question is really, why not redesign for more meat on the bolt with less thread? Off that, I was reading the question. Uh, no, I, I understand. And then maybe I didn't, I didn't make it clear enough, but I'll, I'm going to try. Okay. They are pretty close tolerance bolts, but they still do have play because if they didn't, we couldn't get them in and out of the Starflex. So, it's not, the problem wasn't that the thread penetration, the problem is, is that the whole Starflex has shifted and it's on the shoulder. So when I try to take one out, it's still pushed over a little bit. There's plenty of thread penetration if you do it properly. What we need to do is loosen everything, center the Starflex so that we have clearance all the way around the bolt. Um, there's, if we made it super tight, that would be an issue too. Then we'd have a problem cutting threads as the bolt was going in. It's really hasn't been a problem in my over 25 years of working on the aircraft, as long as we pay attention to what we're, what we're doing. Thank you. Yep. Let's see. Um, next one, it's related to an AD from maybe 20 years ago. It was a 2000-20-19. It's right to the AS350, 355, main gearbox area, the uh, uh, mast area inspections. But the question is, that AD covers all items on the main rotor head and shock landing gear that are part of the 600-hour inspection. Uh, yes. even, even with the associated AMOC, you only get to the 600-hour inspection time for the, for the AD. You're not allowed the additional 60-hour tolerance that Airbus provides in the 600-hour inspection question is, uh, is there any intent to request the additional 60 hours of a revised AMOC? Request a revised I've, AMOC? I've gotten that question and I need to check. I don't want to be careful how I say this, but I think we wanted it and we were told that we couldn't have the additional uh, 60 hours to 10%. There, but I will, 
I will say, I just do also want to mention that with that AMOC, not only do you get um, to go to 600 from five, but you also get to use our master servicing manual and all the references in our AMM instead of going to a service bulletin that's super old and trying to track all that down. It's all there with that AMOC. You get to use, again, the maintenance manual and you get the 600 instead of the five. And I'll tell you that, in my opinion, it's also not that difficult. Uh, I've worked uh, as an example, uh, as a lead mechanic with 13 helicopters. And sometimes I would have to use our margin. Well, not everything has a margin. As an example, maybe I want to go to 600 hours at the time, 500 hours, right? I was going to pull aircraft in for a 500 hour inspection and use the 50 hour uh, margin because I have another broke helicopter. Um, so I want to get that aircraft and, and get it flying. And so our customers can continue flying out to the Grand Canyon at the time. Well, there's a few things that I couldn't, I couldn't use a margin on. Like I had to grease the swash plate, no problem. That didn't take me hardly any time at all. I did those, those dynamic excitation, the ground resonance, that's the AD we're talking about. I did that. I had it done, I think, within an hour. And that aircraft, I made a logbook entry. The aircraft's flying. I'm using that margin, and I'm good. So, yes, it would be nice if we could use that 60-hour margin. I'll ask. I think that that was declined. However, that AMOC has a tremendous amount of value, and that's, that's where I'd leave that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, and um, just on the regulatory regulator side, I'll say uh, I, I was in the office that issued the AMOCs, and we still we still work with Airbus quite a bit on issuing AMOCs. Uh, there is, uh, it's if it's related to an AD, it's related to an unsafe condition, and there's a lot of uh, engineering and determinations of how far you can go before you have to really reinspect something per an AD. It, um, and for FAA ADs, just as an FYI, it, there's not a, um, we don't, we aren't uh, due to a regulation we're not allowed to say, okay, you can put a tolerance in there. It's, you have to do it within this time. And it was before my time, but I'm just gonna make the assumption that that AD was, uh, or the AMOC was given it the 600 hours because we weren't sure the extra 60 hours still provide the same safety buffer per se. But that's just from the regulatory side of what I've learned over the past handful plus years doing AMOX. So cool. thanks for it. Uh, yes, let's sir. See. Um, another question, uh, actually the slide you're on right now, <laughs> it actually was about the, uh, the, the fuel flow control level notch to prevent movements. Can you yes. elaborate, elaborate on it at all? Uh, certainly. Um, okay. So Two different aircraft, a B3, but we're going to talk about this because I think that's the question about the notch, All right? So this is aerial one, that's your B, BA, B2. Okay, so we have emergency fuel cutoff, we have our throttle, and we have our rotor brake, okay? In this position, that rotor brake is up. If I advance that throttle, there's a pin that sticks out and it's supposed to hit that rotor brake. And what that does is it will not, should not allow me to start that aircraft with a rotor brake on, okay? But what can happen, and here's an example, here's our throttle. You see how it's angled over and you can see it here. And there's that pin that should hit the rotor brake when it's applied. And you can get the aircraft, the I think 20, 30% NG, you can get the, the engine will start to spool, but it will not start. That is to say, unless you have, usually in my experience, it's a pilot mechanic relationship and the pilot says, hey, um, the rotor brake doesn't stay on. Can you do something about it? If the mechanic goes out there and files on it, and then maybe he or his friends, they keep filing it. This is, I went to a customer site and I sat, I was displaying this and I showed them, I said, hold on. I put the rotor brake on because I used to start the aircraft. I pushed the throttle forward. I said, oh no, this aircraft will definitely start. And it will, it would have. They got a new plate. They showed me where this notch is supposed to be right here. That's where the new one was. And this is all the filing over the years that allowed that rotor brake to drop. Remember, as a rotor brake drops, the throttle can go forward. This aircraft could be started with the rotor brake on. 
And uh, that's what I was trying to display. I hope that that answers that question. That is. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, um, yes, sir. And we actually brings us to the end of the session time for uh, your part, your presentation. Uh, we do really appreciate sharing the information, a lot of good information about Airbus products, uh, maintenance practices to look out for, uh, and uh, really keep items, uh, your eyes open on items to make sure uh, we don't miss anything out there. So thank you again for helping out on the conference here. Again, we really do appreciate your presentation. Thank you, and thank you for everyone's patience on the world. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Bye. Okay. And our this brings us to our uh, final presenter, our final seminar for the day, our Robinson Maintenance, will be provided by Daniel Rugenstein. He is a technical support and customer training professional at Robinson Helicopter Company, and he had prior positions at Rolls-Royce and Allied Signal. And before uh, we get to Daniel, I just want to put a reminder out there for everybody, uh, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A box to submit questions at any time during the presentation. Uh, you don't have to wait to the end. Um, so that little announcement and right now I'll hand it over to Daniel. Daniel, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, you know, what an amazing event you guys have put on in, in the days here where we're trying to uh, get by with COVID, everybody wearing masks, uh, things of that nature. We really appreciate you guys uh, stepping up and uh, inviting us to do our part in, uh, in safety here. So thank you for that. Uh, let me get my slideshow going here. Hope everybody can see that okay. Comes across good. Great, great. And, hey, as you guys can see here, my name's Daniel Rugenstein. Um, there is my email at the bottom. You guys feel free to write that down. TS4 stands for technical support number four at robinsonheli.com. If we don't get to your question, please feel free to email me afterwards. Uh, tech updates, new products, service bulletin, service letters for all of our models we have out there. Okay, so RHC support, our website, what's, what's all involved there? We try to put as much information as possible, as easy to get to, free of charge as we can. As you can see here, we have free pubs with no strings attached. The reason for that is we don't want anybody to have any excuses of not having the most current publications possible to maintain safety, right? We also had contact information for not only us, but also our dealers and service centers. And there's quite a bit of training involved there too. So let's dig a little deeper into this. Uh, here you can see our publications has current status. Um, in the R66, I kind of pulled it up. We have our pilot operating handbook, maintenance manuals, IPCs, service bulletins, service letters, kit instructions, which are kind of important. Anything new coming out that you might want to modify, we, we may have a kit instruction for that. Uh, some Rolls-Royce guides, how to deal with those folks, and uh, EASA data and things of that nature. Uh, really easy to get to. And all of these, by the way, are PDFs. So you can download them and use them that way. Okay. Um, one other thing we do is any AD note, whether it's uh, against the helicopter itself or if it's for, say, Rolls-Royce, Lycoming, whatever it may be, we list that AD note uh, right there on our website. So you have links to it and uh, very easy to get to. Helps with your research out there. Okay, maintenance manuals and illustrated parts catalog updates. We are going to go completely digital January of 2021 with all of our maintenance manuals. All right, so all that still will be available here. We're just not going to print them anymore. You, uh, like I said, they're PDFs. Feel free to print them yourself. And by the way, right here, you can sign up for free email notifications of revisions to maintenance manuals and IPCs. Uh, use that subscriptions at robinsonheli.com with subscribe email in the subject line. And that'll get you on distribution uh, straight from the factory here. With our publications, uh, a lot of helpful hints uh, to do that. I know a lot of people are just used to working with paper. Uh, once you start working with uh, digital pubs, um, there, there's actually been some changes here. Uh, with Microsoft uh, Edge and some of these new uh, browsers, they try to read PDFs themselves instead of using Acrobat uh, Reader. So, and, and they don't paginate very well with that. So what we recommend is that you download um, all the maintenance panels that you want to use. Um, like I said, use the Acrobat Reader, that's free. Uh, Paginate's much better, and also helps with any connectivity issues you might have over time. 
uh, internet's not always 100%. So uh, you never know when you might have connectivity issues, but you still need the tech data. But this is a safety seminar. So we do want to enforce that you always ensure you have the latest pubs. And like I said, you can get free distribution of that. Uh, with using the digital pubs, the easiest way to use that is to use the keyword function, right? The find function. And uh, on Windows, you can use Control F. Uh, on Mac, it's uh, Command F, and it'll help you with that. Here's a, uh, an example of how our pubs, they paginate really well um, using the Acrobat Reader. You can see you got the chapters on the left, you got two pages here. And, uh, you know, I wanted to see the enunciated panel on an R66. So I went Control F, typed in enunciator, and it took me right to it uh, in the manual. You can see what that little fine window looks like there, and it highlights it for you and takes you right to it. It's pretty handy to use it that way, and uh, really, especially for the guys who are used to using paper and not flipping through the digital pages. Uh, our kits, I was talking about our kits. Um, here's just kind of a, a quick overview of the R66 kits that are available. Uh, you can see we have um, upgrades for like in-one connector. Um, many of you guys may have heard about our inlet barrier filters that we have out. Uh, we have kit instructions for that where you can install that yourself out there. Um, all kinds of different kits that may be available. And you can click on the link there and actually read uh, what the kit entails and then uh, get a list price so you can uh, see what you're in for before you even start uh, working on that kit. Uh, another thing we provide is all of our maintenance records out there. Um, this allows you to download all the pages that would be in your uh, logbook there, your maintenance record book. And, um, you know, a lot of people see quality with their eyes. The cleaner you can keep that logbook and easier to read for people. Um, when you go to resell, especially, it's going to make that helicopter that much more valuable. So we understand that. We want everybody's uh, maintenance records to look nice and clean and neat and readable. So we do provide those, uh, those pages for you. Training, a lot of good training out here. Uh, we have pilot safety course. Uh, we just had the R44 and 22 one this week. I think we have a 66 one coming up too. Uh, maintenance courses, uh, you can sign up for those and see the schedule. Um, we have videos out there like the R66 avoiding hot start video. Uh, it's a very good video to watch and anybody that comes close to uh, starting the R66 should watch that video. Um, hot starts are just expensive and uh, totally avoidable. Uh, you can see some of the other trainings we have there for different safety notices, avionics training, um, and even a Garmin webinar uh, is on our site uh, about all the Garmin products we have. There's what that avoiding hot starts looks like. Um, it is a YouTube video. You can find it on YouTube or you can get to it, like I said, from our website. Uh, we're not going to watch that one. We have another one coming up, but um, this is a very, very good uh, uh, video, like I said, for anybody that's going to start the engine to... Uh, Stay away from that expensive repair of a hot start. Here's our customer support folks. As you can see, I talked about during the mask uh, phenomenon we have going on here. We were all masked up for our picture uh, out front in front of a 66, but you can go there and you can find all of our uh, contact supports um, right there on the, on the website for the home office. Okay, ADSB. Hope everybody has updated uh, to ADSB by now, but we still get stories of people that haven't. Um, so this, you know, this was due by January of 2020, so it's quite a ways out by now. But um, anyway, you can see what we have approved uh, that meets the ADSB. We have a little letter out there for that. It's available on our website. Kind of helps people through it. With that, we also have in our avionics software um, online here. It tells you. Uh, what versions of different software are, were approved together. And, uh, you know, as you have a Garmin suite, you may have uh, uh, different components in there and you want to know, you know, what softwares really work well and talk well uh, with each other. Uh, you can go here and see the date it was manufactured, or if you want to update everything, you can see those levels. Here's kind of what that looks like. The helicopter was uh, during this time, if it was like January, uh, to present, you can see what our current software levels are. And that means we've tested all that together and all those systems work well at that level together. Okay. Dealers and service centers. We know pilots and people move around and you never know when you might be on vacation, whatever. 
you want to fly a helicopter, you need some service somehow. Uh, we actually have a map of all of our folks there, dealers and service centers around the world, uh, right there on our website. Okay, let's move along here to our R22 updates. Um, you can see there's quite a bit here because a lot of the stuff on all the helicopters I just put up front on the 22. So some of these will carry over to the other uh, models, but we have the new windshields, the new EMU, that's on all 2020 ships, uh, R22 kits, including an upgraded heater configuration, uh, some service bulletins we wanna go through, some service letters, and then some maintenance tips at the end. First one we want to do, and this is the video here, hope it comes across for everybody, is a new impact resistant uh, polycarbonate windshields. Let me just play this video. It's a lot like the video you saw earlier. I think this was also a 2.2 pound bird as you see down there. And then our Tesla moment. We didn't use a steel ball, but we used a sledgehammer. The key of the windshield is actually softer. Here you can see how it's trimmed out with the little straps here. That... And right now it's only available on new aircraft. Uh, but we do anticipate a kit coming out in the near future. So uh, hang tight for that. You can check our website for that. Okay, moving along here. The EMUs for 2020, and this is on all the R22s and the 44s. Um, as you can see, the EMU uh, continuously monitors engine, rotors, engine and rotor speed, engine oil temperature, cylinder head temperature, manifold pressure, ambient pressure, and outside air temperature, right? Now this is meant to be a maintenance aid. It's not meant to, uh, you know, uh, outrule a pilot that uh, it, it has to watch the instruments. It's just a maintenance aid. So uh, much like we had on the 66, which was provided by Rolls Royce, uh, a slow flashing light once every two seconds, um, indicate, or no light, uh, there's a fault in the EMU cinders or circuitry. If it's flashing fast, four times per second, that means the EMU is detecting an exceedance and uh, need to look into that for maintenance. As you see there at the bottom, the EMU is intended to be used only as a maintenance aid. It still is the pilot's responsibility to report any observed exceedances. Uh, we have a data viewer uh, that can be used. Uh, it's in the app store for iPads only. Uh, that, that has limited capability. It's really just for a pilot to be able to check and see what the EMU may be saying. Um, but then the maintenance software for maintainers is going to be PC based and that will be available free of charge on our website. It is available now. So, um, and then we also have a, a maintenance manual for all that that's on our website. Okay. Okay, that cabin heater upgrade. Uh, you know, the, the traditional way the 22 always provided cabin heat was by an electric blower motor. Uh, that was right above the battery. Uh, it was not only heavy, but got in the way of the service in the battery and things of that nature. Um, so we have made it more like the 44, where we're going to take that uh, air airflow off the lower scroll and uh, blow it around the heater shroud and then up through the cabin. What that looks like in real life is kind of here. You can get that kit, and the kit is going to uh, uh, provide you directions on where to cut the hole in the scroll and all the hoses, adapters, sealants, things of that nature to uh, change the airflow. Now, some of you may know we've increased the sizes of our uh, mufflers over time. The new mufflers, if you have to go from the old muffler to the new muffler and you have a heater, you will, be, uh, you will have to go to this new configuration. Uh, we do not have uh, the shroud for the old configuration with the bigger mufflers, so you'll have to upgrade at that point, okay? Uh, air oil, here's a service bulletin we had to come out for the uh, 22s and 44s, uh, both uh, it had to do with the air oil separator hose spring. Uh, we had some hoses there that collapsed. So prior to further flight within the next five hours or by May 31st, 
2019, whichever comes first, we wanted you to go look at that and make sure you didn't have a, uh, a hose that had collapsed or been kinked or, or something of that nature and, uh, and replace it. Here we go with a time delay. Well, we had some time delays, some reports of time delays out there uh, that had a um, incorrect resistor in them. So we wanted to change that out and, and they, were, they were failing in the field with that bad resistor. So um, that was also due uh, next 100 flight hours or by May of uh, last year, whichever occurs first. So we hope everybody got that one done. This is one uh, on our, our rotor blades on the end. We were um, seeing some corrosion here and there. It was mainly in high humidity, uh, high salt latent environments. And uh, we only had a, a few revs of our, our blades out there that had these tip plates on them. Uh, we decided it'd be best to take that off and uh, we've given instructions out there for that. Here's a service layer that provides a little more maintenance along with that. Supplemental maintenance below to ensure maximum blade uh, longevity. You know, move, remove any uh, uh, corrosion, things of that nature. We give you a little more limits on that and, and how to do that. Main and tail rotor gearbox oil. Um, one of the big differences, and we always talk about this with the 66, is anytime you service our helicopters, make sure you follow the POH. The um, 66 has always used synthetic oils in our gearboxes. Uh, 22 and the 44 have always used uh, heavier gear oil. Um, that has changed recently. And our newer ones now, you can use the uh, gear oil, uh, the synthetic gear oil, like we use in the 66, uh, now in the gearboxes for the 22 and 44. Uh, we don't want to add any confusion, so we do clearly have uh, some uh, uh, stickers here. That was some placards that call it out. It tells you what can be used where. Um, now, only the newer ones can use the new oils, um, but the new ones can also use the old oils if you want to keep the same oil in a mixed fleet of new and older helicopters. Uh, you just need to make sure you have the proper decals on uh, when you go to do that. Uh, this has to do with inspection after stabilizer damage. I think most of you can agree that um, most damage we see anyway is actually done on the ground and not in the air. Uh, with that, uh, one of the number one components is our horizontal stabilizers. They get hit by doors, they get hit by golf carts, they've been hit by other aircraft, all kinds of things. Uh, we wanna make sure that not only do you replace that horizontal stabilizer, but you do an FPI of the, that app casting there. Uh, you can see the cracks that we've seen in the field previously and that bottom picture there shows where it's it's uh, broken all the way through. So this surface letter really calls that out as a requirement and that's uh, very, very important. If you have that damage, you go through and do that. Okay, service letter, if we're on 21, B81. It's component maintenance course. Uh, we, we previously had a, a component maintenance course that was a lot more in depth. Uh, we've scaled that back slightly due to some changes um, and now it's heavier on the 22. Uh, but it allows you to do things like change the spindle bearings and all the blades and uh, do some 12 year type work on the 22 gearboxes and things of that nature. Um, we have called back all of our old manuals uh, that we had out there and uh, we have a new CMM manual out there for those folks. Um, and we do have courses still available for that. Um, you do need to be a part 145 repair station or for an equivalent uh, for that. Okay, this is an important one with our, our rod in bearings. Uh, by the way, our, our rod in bearings, as you see there in the caution, are Teflon line. Uh, we don't want any lubricant or solvent or anything going in those. It just uh, eats them up. Uh, and you can see the torque stripe. We talked about torque stripe uh, before in other uh, presentations you've seen. We want that torque stripe to go all the way across uh, from the rod end all the way to the rod, right? And um, you see that safety washer here. We talk about the bolt, the safety washer. You got the uh, small diameter spacers there. The spacers need to be in the right orientation, but that safety washer is key. That keeps the uh, rod end in place in case of total bearing failure. And uh, we have seen examples of that where people just uh, don't pay attention and they, they go too far. Okay, let's get to our, our 44 updates. 
Uh, we have service bulletins, uh, talk about the HeliSAS flight control computer, uh, R44 induction hose, uh, chin inspection hole, that's very important. And uh, we have some service letters and some maintenance tips there too. Okay, R44 service bulletin 106, it's also on the 66 here. The HeliSAS autopilot interface with Garmin. Um, Heli, HeliSAS has come out and told us uh, they needed to put a resistor in. It was a communication issue between that and the Garmin displays. Uh, so within the next 150 hours or by December 31st of this year, uh, we need to get this done. And the easiest way is to, to pull out that uh, uh, flight control computer and send it into HeliSAS and, and they can do that work for you. Here we have uh, a service bulletin to a possible failure of the audio warning. And you can see the service letter uh, for that uh, 19011 is available um, on our website. And this needed to be done by last year. Uh, we've learned a lot on these flight control computers as we go along, but HeliSAS has been really responsive uh, as we go, so. One of the things we're worried about, and this is one of my, my favorite comic strips, uh, with any of the autopilots is that pilots are going to get too uh, too comfortable with it and um, they're going to believe it, it, it can do things it can't. Um, the autopilot is is not that smart overall. It, it will let you fly into things. And that's why we talk about what's that mountain goat doing way up here in a cloud bank, right? The autopilot's intended only to enhance the, the safety and reduce the pilot workload. So uh, it's not a substitute for pilot skill or outside visual reference. I think, you know, if you guys have been watching some of the videos of the air ambulance guys, um, they'll agree with that. Uh, everybody likes that outside visual reference. Okay, uh, service bulletin here for the 44 on the alternator filter assembly, right? This really had to do with uh, ADF uh, equipment and police versions. Um, within the next 100 hours or by November of this year, um, we want to get this filter uh, changed out. The manufacturer is no longer FAA approved to produce the parts and uh, if a failure has been reported on those filters. So we want to make sure that gets done. R44 Raven 2 induction hose. Um, this Raven 2, of course, is our fuel injected model. So on these, we want you to check within the next 100 hours or by August 31st, that was of last year, uh, to make sure you don't have it crinkling. We leave these in because we still get reports of this. That's why I've left it in here. Uh, we want to make sure everybody's checking these hoses. Uh, we were having the uh, separation between the inner and outer, outer layers on those. And uh, it's not a healthy situation overall. Chin inspection hole. As you can see here in the R44s, uh, early ships did not have a chin inspection hole. That made it really difficult to inspect the, uh, the foot, uh, the uh, pedal uh, blocks in the front uh, for the tail rotors controls. And so we have put a kit out there that allows you to cut the hole in and it's got a cover and things of that nature that go in there. Makes inspection a lot easier and uh, brings up the level of safety involved with that. Here was a, a vendor issue we had on our five point harness assembly on the lower strap. As you can see here, the webbing didn't go across um, and, and through the uh, buckle properly and it would allow it to actually to break out down there. So I wanna make sure you guys take a look at that if you do have that five point harness assembly. Um, another point, and, and we're going to say this a couple times, is to use the POH when servicing the aircraft. What you're looking at here is actually a hydraulic reservoir, and you can see some gumminess down in there. Um, the report we got in from the field, it was an R44 um, uh, ag sprayer, and all of a sudden all, all four servos, hydraulic servos, were leaking uh, quite a bit. It was leaking quite a bit, making a real mess. And... Uh, you know, we may have one here, maybe two, but all three, something's going on. So we had them take off the whole hydraulic uh, system, send it into us. Um, it went into our hydraulics lab downstairs. We do make all of our own hydraulics. So 
we have a lab for that. Um, once they got in there, um, they called us down and, and said, hey, you got to see this. Uh, as soon as we walked through the door, we could smell something was off and uh, went back and talked to the, to the operator and said, hey, uh, did you recently service, service the hydraulic system? He goes, yeah, yeah, we did. And why? He goes, uh, and, and you're a sprayer, right? He goes, yeah. You, you know, I just went to the farmer and asked him, you know, hey, you got any hydraulic fluid? And he goes, we got plenty of it for my tractor, you know. So uh, that's what they had put in the system. And uh, of course, it, it contaminated the whole system and caused all the seals to leak and gummed up everything. So um, just got to be careful out there what you're using and uh, especially model specific type stuff between the uh, 2244 and the 66. We'll talk about it a little more as we go too. Okay, the R66. Of course, this is our newest ship. We've uh, just delivered uh, a little over a thousand of them now. The new R66 options, we're going to go through those is the shade and fuel flow meter. Talk about the work we've done with Rolls Royce on that. Uh, slimline ox fuel tank, wire strike uh, protection kit. That's important for contracts out there and safety. And the cargo hook uh, for some options. Uh, some service bulletins we have on the modified pop out float stabilizer lithium ion battery, uh, battery compartment stiffener, uh, and lubing of the swash plate bearings. Uh, we have a couple of service letters, firewall drain tube, uh, in one connector upgrade, and uh, engine corrosion prevention. And then we have a couple of maintenance tips too here for you. Okay, the shade and fuel flow meter system. Now this, this is a, a pretty nice feature with the R66 now because it allows you, if you have a Garmin, uh, any of the 600 series or 750 uh, navigators to provide uh, real-time fuel flow uh, information. And it actually adjusts the, uh, the rings, the destination rings and, and how much time you have left uh, based on that information. Um, and what we've done is we've actually worked with Rolls-Royce on this uh, to make that part of the engine configuration. So if you pull the engine off and send it in for maintenance uh, to one of their facilities, uh, it'll still be installed on there when it gets returned back to you. Um, so it wasn't part of the original install with Rolls Royce, but we've got it approved uh, in their uh, installation design. Kind of helps you guys out there with having to put it back on when you get it back. Uh, we have a couple of different uh, fuel tanks now. Uh, you can see the one on the left. Uh, these are ox fuel tanks for the 66. It's what we call our slimline tank. Uh, it's good for 23.2 gallons uh, or about another hour of flight time. And uh, the one on the right was the original one we had, and that was 43 gallons or good for about another two hours of flight time. Now, we never intended for these tanks to um, actually make one leg longer uh, of any type of flying. Uh, matter of fact, you have to transfer the fuel before it can be used for flight planning purposes. It's really uh, made for safe fuel storage uh, for people that are flying out to a cabin that would not have fuel located there um, and then fly back. Um, here's what it kind of looks like installed. Real easy to remove and replace. Uh, you got the two AN fittings and a couple of uh, wiring harnesses and I think eight, eight screws total that hold it in. Uh, you, you can see there that drain hose, um, even if, um, and, and, and I talked about earlier that the fuel is only used for flight planning purposes once it's been transferred. Um, that's because it has a single pump in it. If that pump fails, it's not going to transfer. But if you're out your cabin, wherever it may be, you can always use a clean container to manually transfer the fuel over to the main tank uh, without an issue. There's kind of the, uh, the look on the inside, the controls. You got pump on, pump off, you got a no flow of fuel light. And uh, the quantity button works by when you push the quantity button on the main fuel quantity indicator, it's going to switch over to the ox tank uh, while it's depressed and then switch back to the main tank once you release it. Um, and there's, like I said in the note, you can see fuel is not usable for flight planning purposes until it's been transferred. You can see the large tank, small tank are both called out uh, on the placard. Uh, there's auxiliary fuel capacity in the notes uh, between the two. Um, you can see the uh, time delay circuit right there. It actually has an optical sensor in there that once the fuel stops flowing, it 
turns the light on, and if you haven't shut the pump off, it will shut it off within 10 seconds. Uh, that's to keep you from running the pump dry. Um, as you see in the picture here, uh, the way it works is the black hose coming up to the top of the tank would be the fuel coming from the ox tank to the main tank. And the orange hose is the return. So it's a loop type system. It's gonna pump more fuel than the engine's gonna need. Um, and as it tops off the tank, uh, instead of overflowing, of course, it's just gonna flow right back to the uh, ox tank. Wire strike protection kit. Uh, the reason why we put this in is, uh, you know, a lot of contracts out there, uh, government contracts, whatever it may be, uh, require some type of wire strike, strike protection kit. And you can see pictures of ours here. Uh, now let's put in. We provide the provisions for it. And then Magellan is the one that actually provides the, the kit overall. So on new helicopters, we will uh, put the provisions in. And then once you get it out in the field, uh, you can get the rest of it from Magellan. Uh, you kind of see the prices and things there for that. Really nice if you need it for those contracts out there. Cargo hook, it's FAA approved, right? Cargo hook, kind of nice, um, carries external loads up to 1,200 pounds. Um, the max gross can increase, by the way, for 200 pounds, but that is only uh, in, the, in flight on the hook, not with the gear. We did not uh, requalify the gear, so that extra 200 pounds uh, cannot be used on the ground. Uh, right and left seat controls allowing solo flight. This is the only way you can do a solo from the left seat on the 66 is to have the uh, factory install put in. A load weight gauge and a second set of power gauges are on the left-hand side there, the, the sill for the pilot to monitor. We'll show you pictures of that. And we also have the oversized bubble windows uh, we put a lot of work into this with the guys up north uh, to understand what they really needed. And, uh, you know, an example of that's the utility seating surfaces. Uh, if you're out there in a flight suit and you just have leather seats, uh, you might keep sliding on those seats. So we put a utility seating surface in there that actually provides a non-slip uh, area on there so you don't keep sliding out on the seat. And, of course, some cargo mirrors. Just kind of a look, look at it, what it looks like. Like I said, this is a factory option. You can see that bubble bubble window there is big enough for a guy with a helmet on to look outside the door. Left seat is preferred because of the uh, collective position. And then that window at the bottom that the arrow is pointing to, that's so as a pilot's looking out the bubble window, he can look back in at those engine gauges and the load gauge um, that's right there on that window sill and not have to move his head in and out of the window to watch and monitor the engine gauges. Here's some of the uh, details. There's the engine gauges there on the left. You can see torque, MGT, and then the load gauge plus a hook release. Now it may look like those gauges are, are kind of in there funny the way they're setting, but it is set in there. So when you're outside looking in, uh, it's easy to see the needles and where they're at. Uh, there's your left side controls for solo flight, including the autopilot off. Um, you can see it's approved for rotorcraft, load combination, non-human, external cargo only, right? Flight limited, like all of our aircraft, to day VFR. Okay, modified pop-out float stabilizers. Um, we had reports of some of our early ones that were cracking. Uh, this only has to do with the larger stabilizers that are, are put on the turbine marine helicopters out there on the 66. Uh, so we have since upgraded that. And the way you can tell on the upgrade is it's got a data plate on it now. Um, that currently has a, a lower life limit, I think it's 800 or 900 hours on it. Uh, we are working to move that back up to the 2000 hour life limit. Uh, it's still in testing on that. So we, we expect that to uh, get back to 2000 hours before uh, anybody uh, hits the life limit on those out there now. But like I said, you can tell if it's been upgraded or not just by the data plate uh, shown in the picture. Okay, here's the lithium ion sense battery sense wire. The diode, uh, diodes are always uh, fun to deal with out there. The, the diode in the um, 
in the uh, sense wire uh, was going bad and it wouldn't let the uh, battery heater work. Uh, lithium ion batteries do have to come up to uh, a warm temperature and it's got its own internal heater and that diode wasn't allowing that to happen. So we got a kit out there for that. As with a lot of our kits you can see here, there's no charge if you order it in time. So battery compartment stiffener. Um, we had some uh, issues with the battery uh, hold down bracket deflecting a little bit due to changes in fuel quantity. Heavy fuel loads, the fuel is right above that and uh, hard G forces uh, would cause it to flex a little bit. So we put a stiffener in that area and uh, it should take care of that. You can see the uh, serial number range there for that. Lubrication of swash plate bearings every thousand hours now. So that's half halfway through or six years time. Uh, we want you to go in and uh, re-lubricate those swash plate bearings. We have instructions out there for that in the service bulletin. Uh, this is the same swash plate as we use on the 44. Um, we saw some 66s coming back and they were a little drier. We didn't have any failures, but they were a little drier than we wanted. So um, we did want to re-lubricate those. Uh, you can use the same instructions uh, if desired on the 44. Okay. Firewall drain tube. Early on, we had some reports of uh, some corrosion on the backside of the gearbox on the RR300 engine used in the 66. Um, we noticed that our, our drains on the upper firewall uh, weren't really controlled in where that water went. So we have since changed that in production and also provide a kit for what's out there now uh, to put a drain tube down so it routes the water away from the engine. So we highly recommend you go out and put that on. Uh, you can see the serial number range there, three through 971. Pretty easy change. Uh, engine harness, in one connector. Uh, we've had some issues just on a handful of aircraft, but once it starts, it, it seems to be uh, uh, painful to resolve where the N1 gauge is uh, becomes erratic. And uh, we've we went back and, and made the back shell a little bit better. We have a thermal set plastic that we put on the, the back shell for the N1 connector. Uh, N1, that's the N1 connector right at the uh, the sending unit on the engine. Uh, so we have a service letter for that. Shows you the, how exactly to put all that on, the kit that goes with it. Diesel exhaust fluid. I don't know how many people have heard about this. This was a special uh, airworthy information bulletin uh, put out by the FAA. Uh, jet fuel was contaminated with diesel exhaust fluid. Um, it, it turned out to be a really nasty thing. Um, diesel exhaust fluid was in, inadvertently used instead of uh, prist, basically, in jet fuel. Um, I didn't know much about diesel exhaust fluid before this issue came up and I uh, quickly looked into it and I want to make sure I can learn as much as possible. Uh, diesel exhaust fluid is a urea-based chemical. Um, it's used on new diesel trucks here in the United States. Um, it's not even made to get uh, mixed with diesel fuel in the trucks. It is simply um, squirted into uh, the exhaust. It hits a catalyst in the exhaust. At that point, it turns into ammonia to lower the nitrous oxide levels. Right, uh, it was never approved, of course, in jet fuel. And if it does mix with any type of jet fuel or diesel fuel, it forms a crystalline deposit. Now, these crystalline deposits then uh, accumulate on filters, fuel metering components, and other fuel system components like fuel nozzles, things of that nature. Um, uh, on the first one that happened, I'll put it that way. Um, this this came out of the truck, by the way. This came out of the fuel truck on the airport. Um, you can imagine they probably got a new fuel truck that took diesel fuel um, and had to use diesel exhaust fluid. Well, they probably stored that diesel exhaust fluid in the same cabinet as uh, what they stored the Prist, right? So uh, being de called diesel exhaust fluid, they, they mixed it instead of Prist. And, uh, and not only once, but it happened uh, a couple times. Uh, this time there was a uh, Dassault Falcon 900EX that it happened to. Now, luckily for the Falcon, it does have three engines, but that makes it a little scarier even. Uh, aircraft indicated a clog in the number two filter, uh, engine filter by the same indication, the number three power plant. The number two engine failed at 8,000 feet on approach. 
the number three engine became unresponsive to throttle input, and then the crew landed on just one engine, which also reported a filter clog. That whole incident, and this is the scary part, lasted less than 12 minutes start to finish. Um, you know, there's not much we can do out there except pay attention and maybe separate the diesel exhaust fluid from the prist uh, physically as, as far as storage. Um, I, I hear there's a push out there to maybe even get it off the airport completely. Um, so it's kind of scary when you when you hear about it there. We haven't heard about it hitting uh, our R66 fleet at all, but something definitely to be aware of out there. Here's kind of a little more about it. One was uh, Omaha, Nebraska. The other one was in Miami. All right. So it's happened at least two different airports, hit multiple different aircraft. Um, if you're not careful, I'm sure it'll happen again. And one of our final topics here is the FAA service difficulty reports. And this may not sound funny coming from an OEM uh, such as ourselves, but we really push these reports. We want to exercise that FAA system out there. Um, it helps us um, you know, maintain a level of safety uh, out there. And uh, it also, you know, the FAA put that system in for a good reason. And uh, you get enough reports, they submit them to us or to Rolls-Royce or to Lycoming, whoever it may be. And then uh, as manufacturers, we are required to uh, report back to the FAA on what we're doing to address those issues. Uh, we really, really believe in the system and uh, we hope everybody out there uh, is going to use the system. Now, of course, only uh, 145 repair stations are actually required to do it, but we asked the operators who had any type of operational issue that needs to be reported that way, do the same thing. So we get the whole story as it comes in, the operational part plus what the repair station might see. Uh, here is the website for that service difficulty reporting site. Uh, please copy this down, use it. Uh, it's one of the main things we tell people when they come in with an issue uh, or email us, call us, is please file on SDR uh, on that. So it does cause us a little more work, but we think it's well worth it uh, in the end to keep everybody safe. And with that, that is all I have. So any questions out there? Well, thank you, Daniel. Quite a lot of great information uh, about the Robinson products. We saw different options, service bulletins, service letters, and maintenance tips. Uh, very helpful to the uh, owners, operators, maintainers out in the fleet. Uh, we do have a number of questions uh, that have come in. And you ready for them, Daniel? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We love talking to people. That's what we do all day long here. Oh, yeah. Yep, this is a good conference for this. The first question is, does the EMU on the R22 monitor all cylinders for CHT or just one cylinder? Uh, that's a great question. As a matter of fact, I just asked that question myself recently because uh, this is new for us. And it does only monitor the, the one cylinder that uh, traditionally has a CHT sensor on it. Thank you for that question. No problem. Uh, let's see. I don't know if um, you can probably stop sharing your screen too, if you want. Okay, sure. Now let's keep going. There's a, I have a handful of questions here and still some coming in for you. Oh, great. Is, uh, I'm not familiar with the, what the topic really is, but I'm just gonna read what I got in. Sure. There is a safety alert on R44 Raven 1 and Cadet for burnt valve with lack of compression and possible power reductions, engine failure. This applies to a Raven 1 serial number 2573. Is there any more information on this? It's, it states it appears to be with aircraft with less than 500 hours uh, TT turn time, I guess. A possible rough running engine or yaw in flight. Right, and, and, and thank you, whoever asked that question, I really appreciate it. Um, I, I, you know, we had to get our presentations in a, a month in advance or I would have put this in there. Um, this, uh, this is really a Lycoming issue. We're working hand in hand with Lycoming on that. Um, that when you look at the serial number, the 40E is the roller tappet engines. Uh, we're not sure exactly what the relationship is uh, with that. But um, there hasn't been anything else released yet. That's why we wanted to, I think it was October 14th, 
uh, we put out a statement on this and we just want to get something out there to alert people that uh, for one, and I believe the FAA has uh, a long time uh, advised this, make sure you do a, a complete run up and stabilize hover check uh, prior to every flight. So it's very important that people do that out there. Um, do not initiate flight, of course, if there's any indication of engine roughness, things of that nature. Um, as we, you know, working with Lycoming to get these things done uh, and identify what needs to be done going forward, we surely wanted to get something out there to alert people uh, ourselves uh, while Lycoming's working on this. So, and, and that, that's about all we have at the moment. I can just say we're actively working it with Lycoming. Okay. Good. Next question, I uh, pertain to the wire strike protection kits, but specifically, are there plans for a wire strike protection retrofit kit for the R-22 and R-44? Uh, not currently. We, we haven't seen that being used as much in the same ways. Um, and it was something we definitely wanted to get in the 66 as it was going out for the government contract. So uh, at the moment, we, uh, you know, our kits are based on um, high demand type things and uh, we just haven't had the demand I should say the kits are first based on safety. Of course, we have a safety issue that the kit will take precedence. But after that's the higher demand type thing people are looking for. And uh, we just haven't seen it on the 22 and 44. Okay. Let's see, next question. Regarding Service Bolton 106 for the R44. Uh, question was, how many issues have you had or have you been having with the Helisas and Garmin PFD as this is quite a labor intensive and ship downtime service bulletin. I mean, I guess just uh, installing it, problems with installing, you might've come across. Yeah, you, you know, overall we haven't seen a lot of issues. Um, I will say that HeliSAS has been really uh, responsive uh, to anything we have seen out there. Um, and, and as we understand, yeah, there is downtime, um, things of that nature. Uh, it's well worth it in the safety aspect to make sure we get these things done, so. It's like I have to keep looking to one screen to the other, hit mute. <laughs> it's like, okay, camera here. So, uh, and actually, where my questions are, too. So, let's see. I got a couple of questions about the windshield, the, uh, the impact resistant windshields. The first one is with the new windshields you mentioned, are there any structural modifications made to the aircraft to install the windshield? You know, that's a great question because people really want to know uh, what it's going to take to install these in the field once we have a kit available. And uh, there's no structural modifications to the aircraft uh, at all. Um, it's just simply installing the windshield plus, you know, the bands and, and things like that we have to put in place. Um, by the way, this windshield uh, to me is one of the best things that we've done safety wise in a long time. I think, uh, you know, you can see other manufacturers are, are seeing the same thing and uh, really worth it. Uh, I can say that a high majority of our, it is an option uh, new and a, and a majority of the new ships are getting that. People are going for that option. So, which is good news. Thanks. And the next windshield question, um, are there any special inspection procedures for say a, a post bird strike hit for, with the new windshields? No, and, and you know, that's really going to depend on what type of uh, a bird you hit and things of that nature and how much damage done. Um, uh, ironically, we had a, a cadet that was delivered, I don't know, six months ago or so, but they hadn't had it a week and they took a female mallard uh, through the windshield. And, uh, you know, it was two hours after dark um, and it, they were on final approach and uh, it came through the windshield at the, you know, the worst possible place for a bird to hit is any vertical part of the windshield. So it hit low and then the vertical part went through, took out the carbon monoxide detector. Uh, besides that, the pilot was fine. Didn't really notice much besides the air, uh, made a safe landing and he was okay. But, um, it, you know, that was prior to us having these new windshields out. So um, it does happen and depend on what type of bird you hit, um, is how much damage is gonna be done, what has to be done at that point. All right. Okay. See, and the next question about the windshield: uh, Do the rivets? Uh, I get. Do the rivets suffer any integrity loss if there's a hard strike on the windshield? Uh, I guess we're talking about the rivets on the airframe at this point. Um, and, and once again, and and most of the time when people have questions like this, because you know we can't put every. Uh, 
type of inspection in the book, depending on what happens, um, people will just contact us, you know, and we're going to look at that on a case by case basis. We work with people daily on things like this, and uh, we're happy to do that. And it's just going to matter, like I said, the size of the bird, where it hits, where it hits is a huge uh, dramatic difference. You know, if it hits up high, kind of bounces off, uh, hits down low, it's going to uh, do more damage. So. Find the unmute button again. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, yeah. I let's see. Oh, uh, that's actually the end of the windshield <laughs> question I have. <laughs> I, I do have another one. Uh, guess regarding engines. Can you retrofit the R44 with no 540 with the new in with the new ignition system at overhaul in the field? Let's see, can you uh, make that change in the field? We are not doing that here. Uh, we are, uh, if it comes in, we're putting an old mag back on them uh, as it goes through, uh, or I should say the current the current mag that was out there. Um, but Lycoming does have instructions out there. You can go to Lycoming uh, for that to be able to switch over to the newer mags, electronic ignition type mags. Okay. In keeping with the engine topic, so. Uh, has the R44 engine, uh, time before overhaul, been approved up to 2,200 hours yet? Or do you know what the TBO is for that engine? Uh, on the R44, now we're talking, we, now on the R44, you know, we have the Cadet, we have the Raven 1s and uh, the Raven 2s. Uh, the Raven 1s and Raven 2s, uh, it depends on, uh, Lycoming has a service letter out there, um, service instruction, I believe. Um, that uh, calls out their overhauls and they're kind of conditional, right? Um, and also the Lycoming engines do not have any life limited parts in, inside, right? Uh, but they have their overhaul times based on how you use uh, the engine. And they are all the way up to 2,200 hours uh, if you're flying it on a regular basis and, and if it was either manufactured by them or it was overhauled using their approved procedures. Um, and then for the cadet, it is actually approved to go up to 2,400 hours because the cadet does have the extra 200 hour uh, time between overhaul on the airframe and the engine will match that if you uh, are flying it on a regular basis. Yeah, was, when I saw R44, I was like, ugh, <laughs> didn't know which one really, but. That's okay. <laughs> Let's see, I had a, another, Sort of windshield question, but it's not the, I don't think it's the impact one. So uh, first, a uh, commenter wanted to say thank you for uh, doing the great work you do. But their question and comment is, for the R66, that um, are, are you, is Robinson working on, sorry, for the R66, uh, is Robinson working on an ox tank that can be installed in the field? Also, regarding a 2018 R66, they're having leaking windshield problems, uh, trying to see what help they can get to uh, figure it out because the warranty doesn't cover the labor nor detection of this issue. So a couple of questions in there. Okay, yeah. Ox tank, if it can be done in the field. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let, let me tackle that one first. Uh, this is like a, a, a political debate or something with multiple questions coming from the reporters. Uh, <laughs> it's all good. We know no how to problem. Do. Yeah, we I'll bring them up. Um, the uh, ox tank, uh, it is serial number dependent, but we do have kit instructions now out there to be able to install uh, either one. Uh, I think the serial number cutoff was 719. There were some changes to the cabin that had to be made. And so we don't go below that. But anything above that, um, I believe it's 719. Don't quote me at that. I'd have to go back and look at the kit instructions. But those are out there on our website. So you can go read those, see what it takes to install it, and go from there. Um, now going to the windshields, uh, I'm not aware of any leak issues we have overall on those windshields. They are sealed pretty well. Uh, but please, if you have a, a specific issue with that, um, email me. It was TS4 at RobinsonHelly.com. I'd be glad to address that. Um, and our warranty, we do account for labor if you go back to the original uh, dealer for that is, is how our, our warranty works. So they're, they're, if, if it's under the warranty terms and things like that, uh, it, it does address to the original dealer that sold the aircraft. Yeah, that's uh, got all those answers in that question. It was Great. like, it was a paragraph. <laughs> I was like, go through I break this one up. So you got that one. Uh, another one, and this one's, I believe, more related to the pandemic situation, but 
question is, uh, someone is asking that they're interested in taking the Gen FAM course from you. Uh, any ideas when those courses will be back online? Uh, all of our courses are, are, are actually going right now. Um, we had pilot safety courses, like I said, this week. Um, that was for, the, we did separate, we're trying to minimize the numbers. So one of the things we did to help that was we separated out the 22 and the 44 from the 66 on the pilot safety courses. Uh, that gave us a little more room in the classroom to separate people. It's a pretty large classroom, but now we can really separate people and do it that way. Um, and we're still running our maintenance courses um, out here. So yeah, we're back online. Check our website for the dates that are available. Uh, they do uh, keep that updated on what's full and then what still has space in it, so. Yeah. see, I uh, have the next question. I relate to a uh, stabilizer strike. So during the R22 presentation, you mentioned that after the stabilizer strike to inspect the mounting casting, can you do the uh, eddy current inspection instead of a dipenetrant? No, our standard is the dipenetrant on that. We don't have any data to support any eddy current uh, to that casting. Okay. And next question. Is it possible to have a portal for pilots to check if ADs and service bulletins are completed on a specific aircraft? I'm not sure if that's done at the Robinson level. Yeah, that, that wouldn't be for us. And, um, you, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, if you look at the Canadian website, uh, aviation authorities up there, um, by tail number, they'll, they'll call out what ADs are due for that helicopter. It's, it's kind of, it's unique in how they do it. Um, but yeah, that wouldn't be at our level um, out there uh, for that. But it's a good question. I mean, we're all about safety, but uh, yeah, we, we don't really track what gets done uh, with people out there after it leaves. Okay, Daniel, um, that brings us, that's pretty much all the questions I had and uh, brings us to the end of this, the Robinson maintenance session. Thank you for spending time with us uh, for this conference and relaying a lot of good information for well, I really, there. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And if anybody didn't get their question answered, whatever it may be, please contact us. Uh, we love talking to people out there. That's uh, what we do all day long. So uh, send us an email, give us a phone call, whatever it may be, and we'll be happy to talk to them. Yeah, well, thank you, Daniel. And again, it's been great. Uh, so I'd also like to thank all our presenters today for delivering very valuable maintenance advice and expertise today. Uh, as we come to the end of the day for the conference, uh, say so, uh, just thank you everybody. What makes this conference really good is today was all uh, industry presenting information, helping out the maintenance side of the whole safety concept, the whole keeping the, the safe national airspace system. So it, we really, we on the FA side really do appreciate the, um, I, I maybe say non-combative, it's really too far, but it, it's the uh, basically working as a single team and trying to improve safety out there. So we really do appreciate everybody who presented today. Um, let's see, uh, tomorrow we'll focus on pilot and helicopter operator topics. It promises to be another full day of a very information very useful information and hope everybody has a good rest of the day and evening and until tomorrow fly safe thank you everybody